for actually doing more. Yes, I am. I could have honorable uh, vice chairman for that introduction. Shea Ethel Branch and Chef B for 20 Nishland, Nakai Bashi's Chin, Sitna Jenny Dasha Che, Don Nakai Dashanella, Sezuzi Danasha, Kintana Kehashte. And I'm the executive director, no longer interim, executive director for Yeha uh, Nido, which does business as Navajo and Hopi Families COVID 19 Relief Fund. And I believe we have my deputy director on the line, as well as our legislative liaison. If they'd like to introduce themselves. Okay, we might not have them. Oh, go ahead. Good morning. So I'm going to go ahead and just get started with the presentation. Uh, as I mentioned, uh, for the organization update, I'm now the permanent executive director to provide some stability to our organization and to continue doing the important work that we're doing uh, at, at the high level that we do it. Um, and we are currently still under our fiscal sponsorship with non Nonprofit Legal Services of Utah. Um, but we do have our 501c3 application that is being wrapped up right now. So hopefully very soon we will have our own 501c3 status. Um, we have about 22 employees all over the country and the world. Actually, one of our staff members is a student in Paris. Uh, she's a, a Navajo tribal member from Chin Lee. Um, and then more than half of our staff are frontline staff providing boots on the ground for our COVID relief work. Um, and our three main areas of work are direct relief, resiliency building and housing. In terms of direct relief, you all are familiar with our phase one work related to COVID-19. Um, we served over 500,000 Navajo and Hopi individuals, uh, just kind of counting everyone knew that we served each time we served them. Um, and we, um, you know, things went really well <laughs> considering circumstances in phase one uh, of our work. And then that, you know, by the time we got the vaccine um, and, and you guys were able to roll that out, we had a very strong rollout starting in December through April. Many Navajo people stepped forward and, and were vaccinated. Um, and so our numbers improved tremendously uh, starting in the spring. And, um, you know, we, we always were <laughs> very concerned about the rise of new variants, uh, what those could do to our numbers. So we continued to monitor the weekly data of new cases. Um, in the, the week ending of June 25th, we actually reached a low of 20 new cases in that week. <clears throat> so that was very exciting. But that was, we were also were very concerned because that's when Delta was starting to pick up steam across the country. Um, so we were kind of surprised to see such low numbers, but also very thankful. Um, and so we wound down our direct relief program in early July, thinking that, okay, well, we can't really continue to justify the high level of, of COVID relief that we've been providing. Um, and so we, we turned to resiliency-based work, hoping that um, we were through with this pandemic, or at least the worst of it. And we opened our first community center at Sabine Sky um, Monument Valley. Um, and that opened on August 1st. And that's been tremendously successful. I'll tell you a little bit about that here in a moment. Um, but meanwhile, we were continuing to monitor COVID and we saw some rapid doubling of weekly new cases in July and August. Um, 
you know, starting from that low of 20 cases. So it didn't seem too alarming, though it was concerning as we were starting to see Delta get a foothold in our community. Um, and then the week ending of August 20th, we saw the numbers double from 182 new cases uh, to 418 new cases. And so that was extremely alarming. Uh, we felt that it was necessary to launch a new COVID relief program to address the Delta wave because we felt like that was kind of the beginning of what would be uh, a really tough time with respect to Delta in our community. Um, and indeed that, that prediction has borne out, unfortunately. Um, you know, the week ending of Navajo Nation Heritage Day, we actually saw 469 new cases reported. Uh, the week ending last Friday, we saw 723 new cases in our community. Um, and of course, you know, now we don't have we, the same level of donations as last year. We, there was a lot of media attention when Navajo searched ahead of all the states in terms of the high COVID contraction rate. Uh, so it's harder to raise funds for COVID relief. So we needed to, uh, in launching our new COVID relief program, which is actually our Delta relief program, uh, we needed to be more sparing in our funds and stretch those dollars because we were pulling from funds that were budgeted uh, for other things like opening more community centers and building long-term resilience in our community. Um, but we have launched a Delta Relief Program. It is very strong. Uh, the main component is we provide isolation assistance on demand. We have a hotline number as well as a, a website uh, form that folks can fill out to request assistance. We've served 281 families so far. Uh, and we just last week, I mean, the, the requests have increased. We received 71 help requests last week. Uh, we also have a clean hands project uh, during this or as part of this program. It's actually the third phase of our clean hands project. This phase we're bringing in 250 hand washing stations for households that don't have running water. You know, putting in pipelines is great to get running water to these households permanently, but people have immediate needs um, and they need to have easy access to hand washing opportunities to prevent the spread now and to save lives now. Uh, and so that's what this program is focused on. And we're collaborating with CHRs to get these to the highest need households. Um, and then we also, you know, as the holidays uh, arose, we felt like it was really necessary in order to prevent community spread, to encourage people to stay home, uh, so to prevent folks who are experiencing significant hunger. And then we know that there are lots of people in our community right now experiencing hunger. You know, in the best of times, pre-NGS closure, uh, pre-pandemic, three-fourths of our people were experiencing food insecurity. Um, and of course, uh, you know, things are worse now in terms of our economy overall. And so we expect that almost all of our families are experiencing uh, food insecurity right now. Uh, so we wanted to do something about that. Um, and so we provided a thousand food boxes for Navajo Nation Heritage Day. Um, and that served 17 communities, 13 on Navajo, four on Hopi. And these weren't just a turkey, you know, these were the entire meal because we wanted people to just stay home, have everything that they needed uh, to be able to stay home, not have to visit extended family uh, or public events. Um, and we're gonna do something similar for, um, for Solstice holiday as well and, and Kishmish um, for some people. And then, the other component of this is our PPE program. In September, we put 506 PPE kits uh, with eight Navajo senior centers. We want to make sure that you know, with this focused approach, we want to make sure we're serving the highest need, highest risk individuals. So we are focusing on seniors, children who are unvaccinated, uh, and households that either have a case of COVID or have been exposed to COVID. Uh, so our isolation assistance just goes to those two types of households. Um, but in terms of, you know, the senior centers, we got those 506 kits out to eight senior centers in September. Uh, in November, we were able to get um, 310 PPE kits to four senior centers. Those were in Blue Gap, Cottonwood, Hard Rock, Low Mountain. Um, and then we also um, were able to get 150 kits kits to one chapter that specifically requested the assistance because COVID is surging in their community. Um, and then in terms of the schools, 
in November, we were also able to get um, PPE to seven Navajo Nation schools, including Central Consolidated School District. So that probably was a number of schools. Um, Shiprock Associate School, Black Mesa Community School, Red Mesa Community School, St. Michael Indian School, Pine Springs Day School, and Cottonwood Day School. And we were able to get those schools 35,477 masks, 1,008 eight ounce hand sanitizers, 116 thermometers, and 150 count packages of disinfectant wipes. Um, and then we've also, uh, we received a request from a hospital um, and they needed help with isolation kits. So we provided 126 of those to that hospital. And some of our isolation kits, like the kits that we provide to families that are isolating, they're not just you know disinfectant wipes, hand sanitizer, and three ply masks. We include KN95s, uh, two oximeters, two thermo contactless thermometers, because we're planning for a household that's split between people who are sick and people who are not sick. And we want to prevent any cross-contamination as much as possible. And of course, we are continuing to provide, as we did in the past, two weeks worth of food. Uh, and again, that food is tailored for someone who is sick and can't actually eat real food, um, as well as family members who are still healthy and can have fresh fruits and vegetables. Um, and then, of course, we're helping with other things too. Like if someone needs firewood, you know, we want the sick family to not have to stress and worry about going out and getting the things they need in order to endure uh, their symptom cycles. So we bring those items to the family, um, you know, dog food, adult diapers, baby diapers, all that sort of stuff. Um, and then we uh, are getting ready to launch an elder heating program. Um, we were not able to get a donation of coal from Intex, so we're kind of having to find ways to get firewood in as low cost and effective of, as a manner of, as possible. Uh, so that's still kind of underway. Um, and then one really, really important part of our work, it's a major part of our work, uh, just in the same way that the isolation program is, is our Protect Community Vaccination Campaign. Of course, as you know, vaccines are essential in saving lives during this pandemic. Um, and unfortunately, we haven't made enough progress in the last year. Only 58% of our people are vaccinated. Um, and, I, and when you look at the data, uh, you know, I was just curious, like what, what, how many cases had we had last year at this time and how many do we have now? And if you compare the data for December 6, 2020 and December 6 of this year, our cases have more than doubled. Uh, we had 17,867 cases last year at this time, and now we have 40,123 cases. So that is not good. Um, and then our, of course, sadly, very sadly, uh, the number of our relatives that we have lost has increased actually by a factor of 2.4. Uh, we had lost 631 relatives as of November 23rd last year. Uh, as of November 22nd this year, we lost 1,527. Uh, and right now, more than half, since November 11th of this year, more than half of our chapters have been in, in uncontrolled spread. The numbers keep changing. The highest I've seen so far was 67. I think they're currently at 61. And we map these out actually. Uh, we, we print this map in the Navajo Times and the Gallup Independent Navajo Hopi Observer each week. Uh, we update it according to data. And you'll notice that the um, uncontrolled spread tracks transportation corridors on Navajo Nation, like Highway 160 between Tuba and Kienta, um, Highway 491 from Gallup to Shiprock. Uh, and then of course, Central Agency is just really hit hard. Like I don't think there's a chapter in Central Agency that is not experiencing an uncontrolled spread. Um, and of course they have so many transportation corridors running through the Central Agency. And then of course now we face this challenge of, of Omicron and we, we really don't know what's going on with that. There's a lot of uncertainty, um, but the threat is very high. It's been identified as two times more transmissible than Delta. Um, and then the Moderna CEO announced a week ago that its vaccine likely wouldn't be effective against Omicron, at least the two shots. And Pfizer uh, also just predicted recently, uh, or actually scientists studying the issue predicted that the Pfizer two dose cycle would not be effective against Omicron. And so that has made the need for boosters essential. And we've incorporated that into our vaccine campaign. And we are urging people to not just get their first shot or their second shot, but they're also their third shot. Um, and that's something I would love to see the Navajo Nation pressing very hard on. 
Um, and when you think about the transmission level in our community, like why are these numbers continuing to be really high? Like why are we basically in no better of a position now than we were last year? Um, but if you consider that only 58% of our population, that's just a little more than half is fully vaccinated, then it starts to make sense. Like if you look at the Delta surge in Europe, um, countries that have an equivalent vaccination rate to Navajo Nation, uh, such as Saxony and Czech Republic, they're experiencing about 500 new cases each week for every 100,000 residents. So we're actually doing a little bit better than that, um, you know, with the using our population of 175,108. Um, <clears throat> let's see, uh, that was reported in our, our 2018 Comprehensive Economic Development Survey. We should be seeing 890 ca new cases a week. So thankfully we're not that high. Uh, you know, we saw 740 new cases in the week ending December 3rd, so we, we are getting close, but we're not quite there. Um, and then um, in terms of our resiliency, um, well, just to go to that specific vaccination campaign work. So what we're doing, we're trying to incentivize vaccination, like how do you get people to step forward who are not stepping forward? Uh, we have identified that it's probably folks ages 20 to um, 40 that are unvaccinated. Almost everyone we speak to, like 95% of the people we speak to uh, who are you know, above the age of 40 are fully vaccinated and many of them are boosted. Uh, so we really need to hone in, we're, we're struggling. How do we get to that 20 to 40 year old demographic, um, right? We're finding that the reason people are not getting vaccinated is because of fundamental beliefs, uh, either Christian fundamental beliefs or they only wanna access traditional medicine. Um, so we're trying to break in uh, and, and it, you know, educate people, encourage people. Um, anyway, it, it would be great to be able to <laughs> have some help to continue doing this work. We just completed a grant cycle. We were blessed to have $100,000 to work on this from the Made to Save organization. Um, but we need to continue that work. It's more important than ever right now to continue urging vaccinations in our community. Um, we would love to be able to have mobile units um, and, and work with uh, healthcare services to bring the vaccine to our kids. We, there's a huge opportunity. Our school-aged children make up about 25% of our population based on the data in that 2018 CEDS report. So if we can get that 25% fully vaccinated, that could take us really far. That could really bring that 58% number way up. However, you know, we, we actually are seeing really good vaccination levels in the five or the 12 to 18 year old children. That's identified on in DOH's um, website as, as being 66% vaccinated. Um, but we can make big grounds with the, the five to, to 11 year olds and the kids who are um, you know, 12 and over who are not yet vaccinated. If we can take those units to the schools and just be vaccinating folks there. And that's what we'd love to raise money to do. Um, and and um, anyway, so that's our, our vaccine program. And then also you know, in terms of incentives, we're providing $50 to people who are not, are are not vaccinated and, and get or are not boosted and get their booster. Um, and then if people get their first or second shot, they have the opportunity to win a really cool t-shirt uh, as well as or or a $25 gift certificate. Um, so we have folks calling in to sign up for that. Uh, we've advertised that in the papers, social media, and the radio. Um, and, and we've had over 500 people step forward and participate in this program. And so we're continuing that. Again, we'd like to keep moving that forward uh, with additional funding if possible. Um, because again, right now, no time is more important than now in terms of protecting our community from Omicron. And then, so that is all of our, our relief work right now. Um, and then in terms of resiliency building, as I mentioned, we opened our first community center at Saving Sky um, August 1st. And that program, resiliency building programming, our community centers are centered on developing a strong local and sustainable economy. Uh, and this goes to making our communities pandemic proof and climate change resilient uh, because you know, we saw the supply chain system break down last March, uh, March of 2020. And we saw that Navajo was kind of the last stop on that supply chain uh, flow. And that was a really scary time. Uh, 
when you know access to food and essential items was at risk. And we never want to see that happen again. And we believe that the creation of that strong local and sustainable economy is key to preventing that sort of threat in the future. And we can expect to see future pandemics as well as large scale climate change related uh, disasters that could impact supply chain flow. Uh, so it's absolutely essential to be working in that area. Uh, and so in terms of our community centers, we seek to give lift to the really strong natural entrepreneurial spirit and problem solving ethic that exists in our Navajo and Hopi communities. I mean, you just see that you drive down the highway, you see people you know, selling on the side of the road. You can't stop these folks from trying to, to, to make a living. Um, and um, to that end, we provide small business entrepreneurs and social entrepreneurs with the tools that they need to level up or professionalize their operations, such as streaming Wi-Fi, uh, business machines like a fax machine, Xerox machine, computers, printers. We have a conference room for professional meetings for those folks and uh, conference call capacity. We also provide training, like we have some digital literacy training that we have underway in Monument Valley. You know, we have some folks who um, don't know how to turn on a computer or how to use the internet. So we're teaching folks those fundamentals, teaching them how to type. Um, we also have financial literacy programming that we will be delivering in the new year. Um, we help, we're gonna be helping with business planning and, and business development skills. Um, and then we also have a lot of cultural program because that's the other piece of COVID, right? Like we lot, we were losing so many of our um, language and culture keepers. And how do we prevent that tremendous loss of culture and language in our communities? So part of that is making sure that that's being transmitted to the younger generations. Um, and so we have cultural programming as well that's taking place. And that's actually been extremely popular in our Saving Sky Community Center. Um, and as of November 1, Again, we opened in August, so this would be August, September, October data. We've had 504 visitations, um, 255 unique visitors, uh, 73 visitors are our repeat visitors. Um, we've given 100 tours and we've served overall, served 24% of the Monument Valley community. And, and we define that Monument Valley community as the 2020 census data for Monument Valley and Hal Cheetah. Um, so that is our community center work. Uh, we are gearing up to launch two more community centers in the new year um, and continue building robust, robust aspects of our Sabian Sky community center, like a coffee shop, um, a market, as well as um, building out the programming much further. You know, another important part of um, building, strengthening entrepreneurism in our community is creating a pipeline. So there's a youth leadership component, grooming our, our young people to recognize their potential and tap and giving them the tools to tap into that and actualize it and, and, and to see a future for themselves in our community, a future of hope and prosperity in our community. Uh, so if they leave for college, which of course we'll encourage them to do, they're doing it to get skills from the outside to bring them home and strengthen our communities. Um, and then the third area of work is housing. Um, and we haven't had a chance to work on that yet. And I'm hoping to get that underway um, next year in the new year. Um, but the two areas we really wanna work on is home renovation, making sure our, our families have habitable homes, um, you know, a, a, a non-leaking roof over their head, a nice warm uh, house, a, a place that's climate change resistant, that, that is resistant to extreme temperatures, uh, because, you know, there's only one place to be Navajo, right? And we want to preserve that forever uh, and make sure that our people are, are resistant at, to climate change. And part of that, a very important part of that is making sure that they have a a home that is resistant, resistant to climate change. Um, and then another piece of the housing uh, work that we wanna focus on is land reform. Um, so I, I'm, I'm trying to find, uh, get in, in place the plan for uh, perfection of traditional title, essentially. The development of a registry system and a community that's willing to uh, recognize what our people know in their hearts is their land um, and, and create that registry, create the opportunity for our people to convert their land into capital. You know, if they can sell part of their, their traditional land claim rights, um, even to their own family members, well, number one, they could give it to their family members and the family could have housing. Um, and then number two, if they convert, if they sell it, 
to someone who needs housing, like a young professional who gets a job with the, the nation but doesn't have housing, they can buy uh, a portion of this land claim and build their home there and have the security of knowing that that could always be their home. Um, and then the family selling that claim could use that money to put in place a solar system or drill a well or um, start their small business or um, buy a computer <laughs> to uh, do some of their small business planning on. Uh, so there's a lot of a lot of important work that can come out of land reform. Um, so those are the areas that, that we focus on. Um, and that's where we are in terms of the work that we're doing. Uh, and it's a little bit about our goals and our intentions for the future. Um, and so thank you so much for the opportunity to present. Uh, as always, I always would love some help from Navajo Nation in doing this work. Uh, we have not received a, a single dime from Navajo Nation at this point. This has all been private donations. The, the good, beautiful hearted people of the world uh, who love our people and, and wanna, um, wanna make sure that their humanity is, is recognized and protected. And so they have been very generous to us and we are very respectful of that trust that they've placed in us. Uh, and we work very hard to make sure that every day we're working extremely hard and we're stretching these dollars as far as they can go. And we're, we're investing those dollars in things that will have the highest impact for our people. So I hit that honorable um, chair, vice chair and members of the committee, uh, I'm open to any questions you may have. Thank you very much, Ms. Branch. Any members, the chair will entertain a motion to accept the report. Chair sure, recognize the motion from Delegate today and a second from Delegate Witka. Any members, the floor is open for questions or discussion. Vice Chair, should I wait till all the questions and then address the chair's question? Or should I just answer as the questions arise? Chair, are you going to have a few questions? If that's the case, then um, I'll let you speak freely with the presenter. But Ms. Branch, yes, you're right. Oh, OK. Uh, I think that honorable chair for that question. The data that I'm citing, um, I guess my question is, which data are you referring to uh, initially? But all of the data regarding cases and deaths is from Navajo DOH's dashboard, as well as the data on vaccination rates for um, Navajo children 12 to 18, as well as um, the general Navajo Nation population. If you're asking about the data relating to the Delta surge in Europe, 
um, I'm referring to an article, a German article um, that was published maybe two or three weeks ago, and I can provide the link to the committee for that. Thank you, Ms. Fred. I was just wondering if you were using the data from the daily press release from the Office of the President and the Vice President. Um, so to be clear, Honorable Chair, we are using the data that is on the DOH website. Um, although at times I have used the data from the daily reports. Uh, so it's kind of a, a mix of that data. So it should all be the same data. Um, I believe that the, the daily reports rely upon the data that's reflected on the NDOH dashboard. However, I do know that um, that data is updated. Sometimes there's a delay in reporting. Um, so uh, I, I, <laughs> if you were to go back and, and look at the numbers I used, um, I mean, that data may not be exactly the same because of the updates that have occurred um, but I am using Navajo Nation data. Thank you, sir. Well, you have a follow-up? Thank you, Ms. Brent. Uh, yes, Mr. Lewis was giving me the floor. I was asking those questions with a big smile, so was interested in the response, but in, in um, the aspects of the continuing work, <clears throat> do you actually have a proposal with the budget on each of the aspects that you've uh, um, um, highlighted as you want to go forward with. Yeah. The other is, <clears throat> as a nonprofit, have you reached to, uh, to the divisions and the departments and programs because it just seems like there's uh, funding available within the programs and the, the departments and divisions of the Navajo Nation government. And the type of work that your group um, does, it certainly um, and so the, the reach of the Navajo government, the arms reach to the community. I feel like it's very limited, but the work that your volunteers and um, folks do, it reaches to the Hogan level. And for me, that's the big difference in what you're doing in relation to what the government does. that 
Okay. Um, thank you, Honorable Chair, for those questions. Um, I, I presented a $50 million budget to the Honorable Vice Chairman in um, July, hoping that that could be part of um, the ARPA funding um, because we felt like it was really important. And I still believe that the first thing that the ARPA dollars should be used for is providing assistance to our people, giving them the, the tools they need to protect themselves in terms of PPE, as well as food, because there is so much hunger in our community right now. And, and we need to make sure that lives are protected. Um, and, and nutrition is an important part of uh, people's capability of resisting um, transmission of the virus or contraction of the virus. Um, so, you know, I have that budget and it lays out all the different areas that I've talked about, like elder heating program, um, public health education, vaccination program, um, that would have been, allowed us to do full-scale food relief in addition to PPE, but it does include PPE, and it would provide our teams with more vehicles. Um, it would allow us to staff up more teams. Right now, we have seven teams, um, but we, really, we, we anticipate we're going to need to have about 10 teams uh, to make it through this winter. Um, but um, yeah, I'm happy to revise that budget. Um, and um, in terms of, of the other work that we do, the community center work, um, I have not presented a budget to that, though I do have a budget that I have presented to private donors um, who are ready to fund the, some of that work. Um, but um, I have done outreach to JT Willie in the Division of Economic Development um, because I do know that we're supposed to have um, a Navajo Nation entity that would be sort of a, I would call it a sponsor, but really their regulatory oversight uh, for any outside entity receiving ARPA funds. Uh, but I have never received a response from Mr. JT Willie. Uh, granted, I have not sent him an email specifically on this issue, but I have tried to communicate with him, uh, for example, um, with respect to our, our existing community center activities, uh, but again, have never received a response um, if there is a person who is more appropriate to speak with at DED, I would be happy to connect with that person. Um, and um, so that's kind of the status there. I, I have uh, through the, the generosity of the vice chairman um, and the graciousness of the vice chairman been able to um, organize a, a call with Dr. Jill Jim. And so we have communicated, um, including about coordination of resources. Um, there was no indication that we would be receiving any funds from that conversation, though I did ask uh, if we could be considered to utilize some of the $6.6 .6 million in private donations that Navajo Nation received and is just sitting idle uh, and is currently unused. Um, that Those are private donations that could have come to our organization and that we could be using right now, um, but the Navajo Nation you know, did their own private donation drive that diverted a number of resources um, and you know we're happy to to help utilize those resources and get relief to the people today um, rather than having it just sit there unused because there is such a high need in our community um, and so that's hopefully that answers your question honorable chair Do you have a follow-up at this time? Okay. Yes, really. Um, there is the avenue for the nonprofits uh, based on <laughs> the resolutions that were adopted. Uh, nonprofits could apply to directly to the and submit their proposal to the Navajo Nation Department of Justice. If we do have Mr. Chad uh, Abeda or Ms. Bobroff on the line, could, could you cite that uh, particular BNF resolution um, and that would basically open the door for um, that particular um, 
aspect and would possibly receive good, uh, of, of, let's say, a fair evaluation of the proposal and the intent of the use of the funding. Mr. Beta or Mr. Uh, Bob Ross. I know they were going to be excused for their Christmas meal. Not sure he could impose with this minute bit of. Uh, um, no, Honorable Chair, I, I'm familiar with that resolution, but I my understanding is I have to have someone in Navajo Nation government essentially as a sponsor willing to be our regulatory oversight. I don't understand that I have the authority to to just appoint them to serve in that role. My understanding is that I would need consent and that would sort of be in our application. Uh, and as I mentioned, I have not, you know, I, I don't get responses from DED. So I don't know like <laughs> how to get to that point where I have a willing regulator. Chairman, so this is uh... This is Ms. Bob Ross. Thank you, Ms. Bob Ross. Uh, if we may, uh, Vice Chair Slater uh, allow Ms. Bob Ross to answer the question. Yes, Chair. I mean, I, I could offer some background too, but um, I guess, you know, the, the spot the, the presenter had identified that your organization, she is aware of the legislation and I think it's accurately conveyed what is required. But Ms. Bob Ross, uh, do you recognize? Um, thank you. Good morning. Um, uh, it is DNF Resolution DFS 3121. Um, and Ms. Branch is uh, correct that you do need a uh, 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 a lack of a better word, a sponsor uh, within the government to get that through. Uh, if she's reached out to GED and the Department of Health, and uh, they have not included that in their proposal, um, my recommendation would be one to have a, a delegate uh, uh, speak with a speaker, and I believe we can get that request through that way. Uh, or uh, probably uh, the smoothest is uh, for her to reach out to the uh, FRF office, uh, Tom Quintero. Uh, they are working on, uh, uh, they, they are charged with uh, expediting uh, being a liaison for the proposals and such. Uh, the one thing that uh, I would note here is that um, the nation and the FRF office and such has been focusing on the uh, infrastructure pieces. Uh, the next legislation uh, of expenditure plans will be the health, social services, education uh, type expenditure plans. So they are still being vetted. Uh, so I think there's still time uh, for her organization to uh, get their proposal in. Uh, thank you, Chair. Uh, Honorable um, Chair, if I may, could I ask a, a clarifying question uh, to Ms. Babra? Yes. So first, thank you very much, Ms. Babra, for that very informative uh, piece of information in terms or multiple <laughs> avenues that you've recommended for us. I really appreciate that. Um, and I, I guess my question is, my understanding uh, regarding the FRF legislation is um, that we would be an external entity, so we would not be eligible for funding until sort of the third phase of, um, of ARPA legislation. Um, and, and the health and education legislation, I understood that to relate only to Navajo Nation and programs that were pursuing those um, expenditure plans. And so I would have to wait until the external entity legislation 
for our proposal. Is that not correct? Uh, 
all get uh, approved by the council. So the council can make a determination uh, when they do the approval of who the administrative oversight is. Uh, thank you, Chair and Vice Chair. Honorable uh, Chair and uh, Vice Chair, uh, is it possible to ask one clarifying question? Thank you. Um, yeah, so um, when we initiated outreach, uh, we, we were thinking if our proposal would be focused mostly on the community centers because that was back in June and July. Um, but of course, now that there is very much a COVID response need, um, you know, that that's evolved a little bit. And we have had, you know, success, minor success in having conversation with Dr. Jim. Uh, but Perhaps, so maybe we need to split our proposal so that the community center component goes to either, I would think DED or, or maybe DCD, um, and then the COVID relief. I mean, perhaps that would be my best place with DEM um, under um, DPS. So I'm curious for her thoughts on that. <clears throat> Uh, Ms. Branch, I, I was just saying, this, this is getting into some pretty hard specifics that we would need in writing. And so I think it would just be better if we organize a, a separate call with the Office of Legislative Council to talk, talk these specifics. Um, that would, I, yes, thank I you. I just ask if it could go any, num any, any number of ways. And, okay. Uh, you know, the committee has several agenda items that we need to continue on with. I apologize. But, thank you. Yes. My, my advice is that we have you know, a subsequent call with the Office of Legislative Council. There are a few different options for external entities you know, seeking funding from the nation. They can focus on what might be a thematic oversight or relationship with, say, the Department of Health or Division of Community Development, et cetera, or they could go directly through the Fiscal Relief Fund office and I think those those are options that you know, your your organization can explore going forward. So, uh, with that said, committee members, do we have further questions or discussion items for this report? Okay, I, I just want to offer a couple comments uh, before we go to the vote. If that is. Uh, Mr. Mose or Ms. Manali, can you hear me? Okay. Hello, can you hear you, sir? Yes, we can hear you. Okay. My internet just gave out, so I came back into my phone. Uh, I don't know where I cut off, but I just want to say that I think we need to re-engage with the Department of Health on what their needs are with respect to COVID response right now using the donation funding. Uh, when that legislation was set up to accept the funding and said that the Department of Emergency Management would be the oversight for those funds. So the appropriations would flow through that department. And when we appropriate funding last year for code response from the donation um, fund, that went through DEF, but they're really not the primary entity that is driving the response to the pandemic on the nation. And I think Dr. Jim definitely needs a lot more support. The Health Command Operations Center needs more support. But I think with the deployment of some of the resources, whether it's the isolation kits or food support, um, incentives for people getting vaccinated, we should have a strong look at funding some private or nonprofit partners. And it doesn't have to exclusively be the COVID relief group here, but you know, it can be a variety of sources. So just some food for thought and we should continue to have this conversation um, as, we move, as <clears throat> the month moves forward. Any further questions or discussion committee members? Hearing none, Mr. Rose, can you please provide a roll call vote for accepting this report? Yes, sir. Honorable Paul P. Jr. Green. Honorable Paul P. Jr. votes green. Honorable Fernando Lona. Honorable Green. Honorable Fernando Lona 
vote green. I'm Charlie So. I vote green. I vote green. Honorable Daniel Pizzo. I vote green. Honorable Daniel Pizzo votes green. Honorable Edison Vanica. Green. Honorable Edison Vanica votes green. Vice Chair, I would apply the favor to vote. Thank you very much, Mr. Mose.